Hello, everybody, and welcome. I hope you are all taking best care this evening. For those of you who don't yet know me, my name is Nina, and I'm Curator of Programs and Interpretation at the Williams College Museum of Art. It is my absolute pleasure to introduce tonight's Foraging and Flowers Workshop with botanist Joan Edwards, botanist Joan Edwards and floral designer Wendy Hivelfannon. Wendy and Joan will start us off tonight by sharing some insights from a botanist perspective on understanding and recognizing the plants that you can find in the landscape this time of year. They'll also demonstrate how to use some of those plants to make your own winter inspired bouquet. In the chat, we'll be sharing a link to a resource guide, which includes pictures and information about some of the plants covered in tonight's demonstration, as well as some additional tips for collecting plants and making your own bouquet, which we um, hope you do after tonight. The workshop will run about an hour and a half this evening. And during the program, we will sometimes be showing slides and videos simultaneously, just like you see right now. And you can adjust the size of your split screen at any time by moving the dividing bar to the left or right. Uh, for optimal viewing, you may also want to enter full screen mode. Tonight's program is part of Cures for Strange Times, a weekly art and wellness workshop series taking place every Thursday evening in January at 5.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Every week, a different pair of art and wellness practitioners from our incredible local Berkshire community come together to offer participatory experiences that center reflection, play, making, and embodiment as forms of learning and being. We will be sharing some links uh, later this evening for more information on some upcoming programs at the museum, including next week's final Cures for Strange Times workshop with Aaron Oster of AOK Barbecue in North Adams and Tu Lee from 328 North Farm in Williamstown. We'll also be sharing a link to an upcoming interdisciplinary exploration of sustenance featuring artists, farmers, and herbalists, which is part of our new ecology series. And we'll also be sharing a link um, to register for the restart of our uh, very popular art-inspired yoga series with Emily Kamen, which we'll be resuming on Tuesday, February 23rd at 5.30 p.m. Tonight's program and the additional programs in this series will be recorded and you'll be able to access um, those recordings on the museum's website after the series ends. Also throughout the program, if you have questions, please feel free to use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom navigation bar or the chat um, and we will do our best to be sure your questions are answered. And if you have any technical difficulties, please feel free to write to us in the chat so we can help you. Before I do hand it over to Wendy and Joan in just a moment, I would also like to give an extra special thanks and a huge shout out to my wonderful colleague and collaborator, Ann Kennedy, who uh, is our program coordinator and who's behind the scenes tonight helping to support this program. Thank you so much, Ann. Uh, with that, I'm thrilled to introduce you to the very, very wonderful Joan and Wendy. Joan Edwards is a botanist with a special interest in understanding the evolution of biodiversity by studying organisms in their natural setting. She is a professor of biology and a faculty member in the environmental studies program at Williams. She teaches courses in ecology, plant systematics, tropical biology, and conservation biology. Joan completed her PhD at the University of Michigan, where she also did her undergraduate studies. Um, and I have to say, Joan has been a wonderful collaborator of the museum. I, she will be talking a little later about some of the teaching that she has done with the museum's collections, um, which is truly such a delight to, to witness. And I'm also thrilled to introduce you all to Wendy Hibble-Fannon, who has a rich history as an entrepreneur, creative director, artist, and flower farmer. Her most recent endeavor is Hibble Fan and Design, a floral event design studio located in Greylock Works in North Adams, Massachusetts. Wendy studied painting, photography, and mixed media at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. And in addition, she studied with some of New York's most exceptional floral artists and earned a certificate in floral art and design from Pratt Institute. And um, I would love to uh, turn it over to Wendy and Joan to get us started this evening and just give a very, very warm welcome to all of you. It's wonderful to, um, to see you all and to have you all here with us tonight. So um, yes, with that, I would love to turn it over. Well, welcome everybody. Um, 
I'm Joan Edwards and I'm broadcasting from my office on the campus of Williams College and Wendy's broadcasting from her studio. Do you want to just say hello and wave hello to everyone, Wendy? Hello, hello, hello. We are delighted to be here um, this evening. And Nina, first of all, thank you for your very kind introduction. Um, we're delighted to be here and share some of the different ways that we read the winter landscape through botanical design. We think of winter as cold and sometimes hostile, but in fact, there are many delights that we can see in winter that should warm your hearts as you move through the landscape. We know that nature heals, um, and just by looking at this floral, Wendy, this is a design by Wendy, uh, this floral design, it just makes you feel better. And from an evolutionary standpoint, it makes a lot of sense. Most flowers are designed to attract animals. And while the animals they may want to attract are bees and birds and butterflies to pick up there and transport pollen from one flower to the next, it turns out that we humans come from the same evolutionary line, very distant, of course. At least if you go way back, we come from the same evolutionary line. And what a bee likes often turns out to be what's pleasing to us too. We know that patients in hospital rooms with a view of nature have a shorter hospital stay. Students who are learning uh, remember more if they take a walk in the woods rather than a walk along noisy urban streets. So we know that nature heals and is not just a cure for strange times, but it's a cure for all times. So what we'd like to do tonight is to, um, in the short time that we have with you, is to provide ways of seeing that potentially enhance your reading of the winter landscape and the natural world. And we'd like to take two not unrelated approaches to ways of seeing. First, I'm gonna talk about evolutionary design. Um, I got stuck in the whys of um, uh, my development and the questions I'm always asking is why are plants put together the way they're put together? And then Wendy's gonna teach us about artistic design, putting nature in a different aesthetic context. And here, most of the plants in this um, uh, artistic work that she's put together are forged from nature, from the red of the viburnum leaves to the fluffy uh, seed heads of clematis to the drooping um, infructescences of grapes, um, to the fruits of the buckthorn, to a little bit of, I think there's some barberry stuck in here. Mm -hmm. Nasty plant, but it looks beautiful in this particular uh, display. Joan, just a quick, I'm sorry to interrupt. I yeah. just was wondering if you could speak up just a little. We just had someone let us know it's a little hard to hear you. Okay, um, that's I'm okay. Go closer to the, is this better? I think that sounds better to me. Um, yeah, just as loud as you can be. Thank you so much, okay. Joe. Sorry to interrupt your beautiful that's, speaking. That's perfectly fine. And if you, yeah, I'll try and be as loud as I can. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is um, look at three different um, ways that you can enhance your looking of the natural world. And the first is to look closely and know your plants. The second, particularly in this season, is to note, noting winter activity. We think of plants as being very dormant, but in fact, some of them are extraordinarily active during the winter. And the third is that most plants are planning for spring. They're anticipating spring, which I think probably all of us are at this point in our lives. And here, looking closely at three plants, this is our wonderful, iconic native goldenrod that has gone to seed and also has a gall here. This is an invasive plant, the seed head of burdock. And I like to show this one because this is the, the bio inspiration for Velcro. You know, a burdock gives us great problems when it gets caught in the fur of our dogs and uh, on our fleeces and so forth, because it has these little grabby uh, prongs at the tip of each spine. But this in fact is the basis for how um, Velcro was invented. 
And finally, this is a close up of a very nasty plant actually, introduced plant, Multiflora rose, uh, which has beautiful bright red berries that, and we urge you to pick as many of these as possible to remove them from the landscape, but enjoy their beauty indoors. So looking at things closely, and I just have one hint on looking at things closely, it's great to have a hand lens. Um, I always walk with my hand lens and uh, one thing that people, a lot of people don't seem to know is how to use a hand lens properly. So I had my husband take this picture of me today. You want the lens to be close to your eye and you wanna be looking through the lens and then you wanna bring whatever you're looking at up to the lens until it's in focus. And then all of a sudden everything will pop out and you'll be able to see the details of the plant that you're looking at. So looking at things closely, I thought one of the best ways to illustrate this would be to look at an um, assignment I do um, at the Williams College Museum of Art with my botany class. And what I do is I give them a painting, an original work of art to look at. And this is my favorite one to have them do. This is um, Georgia O'Keeffe's skunk cabbage that she painted in the spring of 1922. And clearly it's a spring blooming flower. So that makes a lot of sense. And the other thing I want you to note is that it's large. It's about two feet tall, much, much larger, of course, than the plant is in nature. And the assignment for the class is to go to the museum, to sit in front of the painting, to look at it, maybe to go away, come back and look at it again, and to really take in the painting and then to write a short description of what they see when they look at the plant. Then we go and we look at the plant in nature. And here's skunk cabbage in its natural habitat, which is swampy, wet soils. Uh, skunk cabbage is New England's earliest blooming wildflower. And what you see here is not the flower per se, but you see this very thick outer leathery um, wrapping called a spathe and inside are the flowers. And what's remarkable about skunk cabbage is it can bloom right through the snow. And in fact, we're about, we're less than six weeks from their bloom. They will bloom in mid-March, maybe even the second week of March in Williamstown. So we're not too far from the very first uh, flowering plants uh, for the spring. These bloom through the snow. And the other thing that's distinctive about them is they have a very strong odor. When I visited last spring, now you can see all these little skunk cabbages here. They're I'm surrounded by them. And they're all putting out this incredible skunky odor, hence the name skunk cabbage. So they're quite odiferous. And the reason they can do this is skunk cabbage can heat up and it can heat up to 70 degrees, which is pretty amazing. These are data we collected on skunk cabbage. Let me just walk you through the graph. This is looking at temperature in Fahrenheit on the y-axis and date covering about a week on the x-axis. And first, just for reference, look at the teal line, this one here. This is the ambient temperature, and this, so that makes sense. It gets warm during the day and then goes down below freezing. Freezing is right about here. It goes below freezing at night, rise above freezing during the day, and so forth. This is in the latter half of March. And then look at what the skunk cabbage is doing, and the best plant here to look at is the one that's outlined in yellow. You can see the yellow line is almost always above the teal line, no matter whether it's day or night, it heats up and it even gets up to 70 degrees uh, on this day, even though it was actually a pretty darn warm day, it got almost to 60 temperature in the real world and the outside temperature, but uh, the skunk cabbage itself hits 70. So it heats up that allows it to power through the snow. It also allows it to release an odor and that odor of course attracts animals for coming in, but there's more. If you look closely at skunk cabbage and look and see what's inside, they're really extraordinary flowers. If you look inside a spathe of a, of a skunk cabbage, you'll find a spadix, which is this egg-shaped structure that is tiled with flowers. So each of these little dots marks the center of a flower. And what's interesting about skunk cabbage is that it is female first, and then it, the flowers switch to being male. 
it turns out most flowers are bisexual. They have both male and female function and botanists call flowers that have both male and female function perfect flowers. Mm -hmm. So skunk cabbage has perfect flowers. And you can look here, this is, I took um, a cross section of this egg shaped structure. You can see an individual flower here. The petals are L shaped and uh, form a cup around the uh, reproductive parts. And here you can just see the female, the style and the stigmatic surface just stick up above the flower. And the stigma is where the pollen is received. If the pollen gets to the stigma, it will grow down and fertilize the eggs. So skunk cabbage is female first. And then if you wait a little longer, up from these flowers will protrude the stamens and the stamens will split open and release the pollen. So in this particular um, inflorescence of flowers, the lower ones are still female, the upper ones are have developed into males and are releasing pollen. And beetles and flies are the most attracted to this plant. The outside is supposed to mimic dead meat, so you get carrion flies and carrion beetles that come in. And they also, I think, might enjoy the warmth. And um, they will pick up, they'll probably eat the pollen but they'll also get bathed in it. And when they go on to the next flower, will the next inflorescence, they'll carry that pollen to the next plant. So this is a beautiful functional design in terms of uh, if you're going to bloom early, you have um, exclusive um, control over the insects. There aren't too many other things you're competing with. And then after we do this in the class, I have the students go back. So about spring break, they go back and they look at this again. And it's extraordinary. You may even be viewing it differently as you're looking at this picture now. Um, and they certainly do. I mean, they see this glow of light, not just being light, but actually being heat emanating from the plant. They often mention this inner glow that they see, that they link up to the sexuality of the plant. Um, so they see it in a totally different way. They see this almost as flames coming out of the plant and they have changed the lens with which they view the flower. So I just think this is a beautiful example of how if you look at it carefully and you know the detail of the plant, it changes how you enjoy it, how you interpret it. And the question you might ask is, did Georgia O'Keeffe look at these plants carefully. And it turns out she was a fanatic about looking at flowers carefully. And I'll just read the latter part of this quote and then I have a second quote in my next slide. She says, I'll paint what I see, what the flower is to me, but I'll paint it big and they will be surprised into taking the time to look at it. I will make it I will make even busy New Yorkers take time to see what I see of flowers. So she recognized the importance of looking carefully and understanding the subject that she was painting. And I also love this quote that came out with um, an issue of poppy stamps, Georgia O'Keeffe poppies, which I love these stamps. I can't bear to mail letters with them. I just keep them, the whole sheet to look at. Here she said, Nobody sees a flower really, it's so small. We haven't time and to see takes time, like to have a friend takes time. And so I'll just mention in this time of COVID when it is so much harder to connect to people and to make friends, you can make friends with flowers. They don't carry um, SARS-CoV-19. Um, Nineteen, and uh, you can make friends with flowers, and that can fill some of the gap. Of course, not all of it, but it really has been an enriching source for me. So, looking closely is important. I'd like to go through a second example of looking closely and um, sort of dissect how I like to look at flowers. Um, I like to think of flowers as a puzzle. And I like to figure out how they function and how they work. And to do this, I picked Alstroemeria, which is not native to here. 
and not native to, in fact, native to uh, South America. It's found in the Andes um, of South America. And it's also called the Peruvian uh, lily. And, um, but it's very available to, to us, as you'll see in Stop and Shop and various different grocery stores. So this is something all of you can do um, if you can order the flowers, which you can do. And so um, if you look at a flower, it really is a puzzle because it's designed to um, carry out um, pollen transfer, pollen that has the sperm, carry the pollen to the stigmas that are the pathway to the eggs, and then you get seeds and then you get reproduction. So all of this is about sex and reproduction. And if you look at this flower, what you'll see is three, um, three petals here. These are the outer petals here, three outer petals. And then there's three inner petals. But if you look at the inner petals, they're not all alike. The two upper ones frequently have these markings on them, these lines that point down towards the center of the flower. And then the lower petal doesn't have any markings on it. And it turns out these lines are nectar guides. And these, these nectar guides are pointing pollinators, which could be a bumblebee or, being the New World Tropics, it could be uh, hummingbirds, which are just really quite amazing in the New World Tropics, that are coming to visit these flowers to collect nectar. And if you look, these two petals also have these little holes at the base, little sort of tubes, almost like a capillary tube. And those tubes are lined with specialized glandular cells that release nectar. So pools of nectar accumulate in these um, uh, tubes, these upper two petals. So now you see the overall design of the flower. The reproductive parts are here, and perhaps you can see this a little better in this next slide, where here you can see those upper petals that have the nectar guides, and here you can see the reproductive parts of the flower. These are the stamens, which um, in this particular Ulstrom area have this sort of uh, greeny gray uh, pollen, and then here you can also see the female portion of the flower, the stigma, and these little tips of the stigma are where the pollen has to get to for pollination. And what you need to keep in mind is that the pollinator comes in from here. It, come, it wants to get to those two uh, nectar bearing uh, petals and it comes in here between the nectar bearing petals and the reproductive parts. And then I want you to watch what happens over 10 days. Oh, I just want to point out here that you can get these Alstromerias. They're ubiquitous in grocery stores and they're wonderful flowers to have in your house. They come in many, many different colors. Um, and I got these by, I haven't been in a grocery store since March. And I just ordered these, put these in my online order from a stop and shop. And when they brought my groceries out, she brought me a bouquet of Alstromeria. And you can get these and you can do the same thing that I'm going to show you. You can watch these flowers develop over time because it's really quite astounding. So this is a time lapse video that I took of Ulstrom area about 10 years ago. I did this actually from the end of March to April. But of course, you can do this any time of year because you can get the flowers anytime. And I've taken away some of the petals. You can see the uh, nectar track petals here. These are the stamens. These are ones that are long and waxy, haven't opened yet, but then they split open and they shrink down into a little ball and they do them in two flights of three. So these three are gonna go first. This is the next one that will go. There it goes. And notice they're also starting to curve up a little bit. And then remember the insects and birds are coming in from here. They're coming from that area down. Oops, we'll keep going here. This one is the next one that's gonna go. So it splits open and shrinks down into a little ball with a sort of brown pollen in this particular variety. And then the next one is gonna go. Oops. And then finally, the last one is gonna go and notice as they go, they tip up so that they're in a perfect position to put pollen, to dust the belly of a bumblebee or a bird with pollen. But then look what's happening here. This is the style that's growing out here. It's just amazing. I, I've seen this many times and I'm still just amazed by it. The style comes out, 
comes out. It hasn't split into three yet. And notice not only is it moving and elongating, but it's moving up. Meanwhile, the anthers, which in the real world would have lost all their pollen by now, they're dropping down. And the styles continue, continue. And now you can just start to see the three lobes of the style. And the stamens are still continuing to drop down. And then the, uh, you can just maybe start to see a little pollination droplet that appears on the tip of each of these stigmatic lobes. It forms a little sticky ball at the tip of each of these lobes. The male phase is going out, the female phase is moving in, and pollinators then coming in from another flower will, the pollen that's on their bellies, will stick to these little pollination droplets and affect pollination. It's really amazing. So this is a plant that is unlike the skunk cabbage, is male first and then female. And it's a beautifully orchestrated sequence. Okay, those are my examples of looking closely and I hope that you'll all get all stromarias and take a look in your own um, on your own, because it's really fun to see it happening in real time. The second category is um, how we think of winter. And um, the amazing thing is we think of it as being cold and everyone bundles up and stays inside. Well, first, you shouldn't just stay inside. You should get out as much as you can. Um, and when you do that, think of the plants, because the plants are not just sitting around waiting for spring. Oh, they're anticipating it, but they're not just waiting. Many of them are very, very active. They're winter active. Two examples here. Here's the Asian bittersweet, another nasty invasive plant that you should please pick as much of as you can. And um, hemlock, a wonderful native evergreen tree. So uh, bittersweet, any plants with berries are dispersing their seeds in the middle of winter. Birds come in, eat them, and uh, deposit them in new places where they can grow a new plant. Anything that's green is actually photosynthesizing. It is, uh, even when it's cold, it photosynthesizes much slower, but it's capturing that sunlight. It's taking carbon out of the atmosphere, and it's making sugars. Uh, so if you go in and you look at that winter landscape, all of these conifers, all these plants that are green are photosynthesizing, even when they're covered with snow. Uh, as long as they can get some light coming through to the plant, they'll photosynthesize. And we can see other examples, even under the snow, light penetrates under the snow and uh, mosses, for example, that are green are photosynthesizing. The, um, these are horsetails, uh, which we'll talk about a little later. Uh, those have green photosynthetic stems. They're making sugars and fixing carbon. If you go and look at any New England landscape, any New England forest, you'll see patches of green on the forest floor from the shield, spinulo shield fern to Christmas ferns that are photosynthesizing right through the snow. They lay their leaves out flat for maximum surface area and they just take in energy from the sun and photosynthesize right through the winter. There's even cryptic photosynthesis occurring where you don't even think that a plant might be photosynthesizing. And my favorite example of this is um, the aspen tree, which has this gray green bark. And if you go up to that bark and you just wipe your fingers on it, you'll see a white powder comes off on your fingers. It turns out that white powder is sunscreen. And actually in a pinch, if you forgot to put on sunscreen, you can go to an aspen tree, grab a little powder from the trunk and stick it on your nose. Um, but why does it need to have sunscreen? It needs to have sunscreen because if you just scrape down a little bit, although I wouldn't advise doing this, I did this for the purposes of this um, presentation, you see this emerald green layer that is chlorophyll in chloroplasts, that is photosynthetic bark. And what the tree is doing, you get very intense solar radiation, it 
in the winter time, and it's protecting that solar radiation from UV damage. Chlorophyll can be bleached by solar radiation, and here the aspen tree actually covers its trunk with this um, substance to keep it from bleaching out. And my final idea of looking at winter plants is anticipating spring. I think one of the things that's so unexpected is that all of these plants are planning to take every advantage of spring when it comes and to maximize what they can do when it's uh, warmer and sunnier. So they anticipate spring. And one of the things that really um, helped me get through the initial shutdown that we had last March, April and May, the beginning of our shutdown was I took huge solace in walking the woods and watching the hills of Williamstown green from the bottom up, watching those mountains green. And you just see them green from a wave going from the bottom all the way up to the top, the highest mountain. And if you look at that green, it's not just one green, it's many, many different greens. Sometimes it's bronzes, sometimes it's pinks. It's beautifully colored and it's just like the whole world is breathing again. It's really a, a remarkable thing. And sometimes people don't notice it. So make sure you look for that this spring. And in anticipating spring, plants have packaged things really quite beautifully. And one of the ways to look for this is to look at their winter buds. Every woody plant has winter buds that sit through the winter waiting for spring. Um, this is one of my favorites on the right hand side. This is the winter bud of a butternut tree, which is a native um, upper floodplain tree. They're actually in trouble right now. They're being hit by a fungus, um, but they have the most adorable um, buds and leaf scars. What you see here is a leaf scar and you can see this beautifully with your hand lens if you take a hand lens into the field. And this is where the leaf was attached. This was the late where the leaf was attached and these little markings here, these dark markings are where the vascular stem uh, system came through. And at the axle of the leaf, you have these little tufts of hair. So it really looks like a miniature monkey face. And then this is the bud that will elongate into next year's uh, leaf. So it's really beautifully packaged and fun to look at. One that I'm gonna spend a little bit more time on is the Norway maple, also not a very good plant. It's invasive, but it has beautiful buds. And this is a flowering, um, a bud of, of holding a flower inflorescence of the Norway maple. And this is what the bud will look like uh, when you see it. These are uh, leaves here that are, will come out. And these are leaves. This is the leaf scar. This is where the leaf was attached. But let's take this one bud and then um, look at it a little bit more closely. And what I'm doing is going to peel these bud scales away. These, so I'm going to take these outer bud scales, this set, this set, and this inner set away. And what you get inside is this really amazing, the inner bud scales of Norway maple look like seal fur. They have this just beautiful um, texture and uh, these hairs, these dark chestnut brown hairs um, that line the bud. And then there are two more buds here. There are ones that open this way and then ones that open away from us and towards us. And if you um, take those out, what do you find inside? This is amazingly an entire um, inflorescence. It's about um, a dozen tiny flowers that are ready to go in the spring. And um, sort of unfortunately, but, but you can see this in the spring, we, uh, Williamstown has many, many Norway maples and they will put these inflorescences out of lime green flowers, balls of lime green flowers that you'll see in the spring. These are the flowers up close. Each of their, they'll develop into about 12 of them and they'll form these hanging lime green balls from the trees, but they've anticipated spring. They're ready to go. They flower before they leaf. They jump the gun because they've got everything ready. Uh, anticipating spring, this is my last example, are um, horsetails, uh, equisetum, uh, that are a kind of um, 
just amazing fern. They're living dinosaurs. They, they uh, came way back from when. These are the only ones. They used to be tree species. Now they're just these shorter ones. This is Wendy out foraging for horsetails um, along uh, Hopper Creek. And um, these do, these also are anticipating spring with their little cones at the top of each of these stems. They also have photosynthetic stems, by the way. So they're winter active. If you look at the cones, you'll see the cones have little hexagonal shapes on them. These hexagonal shapes in the spring will separate and then they'll tip up a little bit and hanging down from the underside of these hexagonal um, mushroom shaped structures are little sacks and these sacks are filled with tiny, tiny little emerald green spores and you can see bunches of them here. If you look very, very closely and this is using a scanning electron microscope, you'll see each spore and this is the microscope only takes it in um, black and white so but imagine this is a shiny emerald green. It has four arms or what we call elaters that stick out. And it turns out that they're bilayered. So they have an outer layer that is spongy and picks up water and loses water really quickly and an inner layer that's stiff. And that combination allows these arms to open and close to either curl shut or flip themselves out really quickly. And people have been wondering about the function of these for a long time and I think we figured it out. This is a high speed video that my student Ben DeMeo took where this is the cone, the bottom of the cone, and these are spores dropping out of the cone. And when they drop out of the cone, they're wet so the elaters are curled, but they rapidly dry when they fall out. And when they fall out, they fling their arms out, they capture the wind and they fly which is just really astounding. So whenever I see horsetails in the field and I see the spores being dispersed, I said, oh, they're flying. They're throwing their elaters out and they're flying. But that's not all. If you look a little bit further, what happens is once they land on the ground, these spores can dance. And so this is actually taken in uh, actual uh, with color. You can see the lime green spores and I got these to move by just breathing on them and the breath from my air would make them curl. The moisture in my breath would make them curl. And then their feet are a little bit sticky. So they stick and move around and they can walk. And the idea here is they'll move around on the ground until they fall into a little area that has water. And if they fall into a wet spot, they'll stay curled up the whole time and they'll germinate into a new Horsetail. So just really beautifully the dancing spores of Equisetum. So in my part, just three tips. Look closely, know your plants. Recognize winter activity. These plants are doing a lot of things. And if plants can be active out there, we can too. And third, anticipate spring. Um, be ready for it. Be ready to take it all in, in all of its glory. And now I'm going to, um, and Wendy and I foraged, so I'm going to turn it over to Wendy. And um, this is the slide to turn it over to Wendy. She has a few things to show you first. Um, so Wendy, you should come on. This is what she foraged, what we foraged on a walk down Hopper Road. Um, there were plants, you can find plants really easily on the side of the road in vacant lots. Even if you live in a city, you can find uh, plants to put into your uh, displays. So Wendy, I'm turning it over to you. Okay, thank you, Joan. That was absolutely fascinating. Thank you. Do you want to go to the next slide? Sure, sure. So I'm just going to show you a few slides of some arrangements I've done in the past that um, have a lot of forage pieces or some anyway. Uh, so this one uh, is a May uh, arrangement. So there's some dogwood there and um, some uh, birch a little hanging down there at the bottom. And um, uh, Joan, I think you said that that other one kind of in the middle might be cherry. 
I think it might be a cherry. I'm not positive, but I think so, yeah. Okay. And then down um, on the bottom left there, that big clump of foliage is uh, from black cohosh. Oh, wonderful. And then the next one is just a, a June arrangement with um, apple branches. Got some apples. Yeah. Uh, that was actually a, a tremendous year for apples. They, I had to actually cut apples off because they were so heavy. Uh, but they, I just love what they add to an arrangement. And then the next one, I think that was also June, must be because of the peonies. Uh, so that big thing at the top is Angelica that you can find on the road, along the roadside, all over the place. Uh, they're very tall. Um, I think they might be poisonous yeah. in a certain way. <laughs> Don't eat it. Many um, members of that family are poisonous. Yeah. Um, and let's see, the, the pink flowers are salmonberry. Yes, and I was just gonna comment, I love the salmonberries. It's a type of raspberry. And um, what's amazing is they have the Latin name Rubus odoratus, but they have no smell. And there are several raspberries or members of the genus Rubus that are like that. There's Rubus uh, parviflorus, which means small Rubus, and it's a huge flower. And I think the person who named the Rubuses was just so frustrated, he made botanical jokes. So this is kind of a botanical joke that it's Rubus odoratus with no smell. I wouldn't mind being a botanical joke. Maybe I am. <laughs> Uh, there's also some um, Virginia creeper vine in this one, and some, uh, which I think that's Wigila, not Nymar. Oh, sorry. Oh. Wait, where's your Virginia creeper? Ooh. The vines. Yeah. Is it this one? Okay. Yeah, both of them. That one and the one hanging down. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And let's see. The next one um, is garlic scapes, obviously. And uh, the red branches are barberry. Uh, yeah, it is a nasty bush, but um, lovely colors. Um, and then some, uh, there's a little tiny little rose in there. It's not a wild rose, but it could be. <laughs> it's so tiny and it's got the little gray red foliage, which you might be able to see up top there. Yeah. So yeah, that was June, July ish. And the next one, uh, that would be October. Yep. Um, so it's got the bittersweet vine going up there. And then the that bright, brightly colored foliage is actually a fothergill plant, which is cultivated. Um, and it's, it's a tiny, my one, the one that I have is tiny. Uh, it has little little fluffy white flowers in the spring, um, but then the foliage is just tremendous. So how to use it. Um, and then let's see, the last one wow. is um, a giant mantelpiece <laughs> that I did for a wedding. Um, we've got some red maple up there, uh, lots of various random branches, <laughs> um, some with leaves, some without, some grapevines. Um, and then actually a, a lot of the, the greenery part is uh, wild Texas smilax. So imported from Texas, but wild just the same. Um, and then lots of other um, wholesale cultivated uh, greens and flowers, but um, it's a big one. <laughs> uh, so, yep, so that's that. So um, this one actually is, uh, Joan already showed before, it's, it is all foraged and it's actually, that was pretty large too. It was probably three, three to four feet and you know, all over. <laughs> um, so um, 
I guess that's it for slides. All right. So thank you, Joan. You're welcome. That was, those are those <laughs> stunning, stunningly beautiful. Okay. So am I on? Um, yes, you are. Okay. Okay. Um, so uh, thank you all for showing up tonight. Um, I thought I would start out by just showing you what we forage and what I've got here with me. Um, got a big bucket of various greens. With the greens, I've got some beech leaves that are dry, but they stay on the branch. Oh, let's see. Got some beautiful golden willow and some dogwood that I tried to force and it actually just barely started to sprout just in the last couple of days. Uh, let's see. Privet berry, some blueberries that I love. Some random and various dried pieces. Yep. Japanese knotweed. Yeah. Pick all that that you can. Um, Bittersweet, some birch branches, and I forget what these other ones are, a couple others. Um, rose hips, these are so nasty, they're going to, uh, they're going to be all over me. <laughs> um, the horsetail and some of the lovely green ferns. And I also pulled some of the cinnamon fern and some hydrangea just because. Um, so, as far as arranging, you're going to want to choose a vessel. Um, here's one for starters, just make sure it's clean. Uh, and then you're always going to need something to secure your stems. So I recommend chicken wire. This is green coated chicken wire. It's easier on the fingers um, and you can get it at Home Depot comes in a little roll, two foot long, uh, wide. Um, and I just want to curl it up into a ball that will fit. And so what this does, it will have a, a top and a bottom. So when you stick a stem in, it'll have a place to catch at the bottom. So you want to keep it not quite at the bottom of the vessel, but a little bit further up. And just squish it in. Squish it down in there. And then if you can get your hands on some waterproof tape, um, it's floor supply. There it comes in clear and green. And then you just want to um, secure it it down so that it doesn't pop out with all your stems in it. Um, see, one of the other things, I guess back a little bit to foraging, you want to make sure you have some good heavy duty clippers when you're out foraging. And um, when you're when you're cutting things, if you're, well, definitely don't go in anybody's yard. Don't cut from the front yard. 
uh, but you can ask and maybe they'll let you, but even so don't cut anything you know, right in the front or where you're really gonna notice it too much. Try to go in the back of the, of the tree or uh, shrub and maybe low if you can, like I cut some, uh, the white pine, just very low to the ground. Couldn't even tell that, that it was gone. But you also, when you're cutting things, you wanna cut at the joint or elbow or what the technical term might be, <laughs> Joan. <laughs> Sounds good, joint is good. So that goes for any, everything really when you're cutting. Um, so you have your, your heavy duty clippers for out in the field. And then when you're in, in the studio or working with your flowers, um, some smaller clippers, um, you can use sharp scissors too. Um, and then wire cutters for your uh, chicken wire. Um, some other things that you can use instead of chicken wire um, on smaller bases, you can just use the tape and just make a grid, uh, maybe three across and three across again. Um, that's, it'll do in a pinch. It's not real sturdy. Um, the other thing uh, is a, a pin frog, which I'm sure you've probably seen. Um, you secure it down to the bottom of the, of the vase um, with floral tack. Um, and then just stick them in. Um, it's, it's a little trickier to use um, and they're, they're really expensive, um, but they can be great. And the other thing that I definitely do not recommend is floral foam. Works great, it's really easy. You just soak it in water, um, cut it to size, stick it in, and everything just stays where you put it, but it's really bad for the environment. It's a petroleum product and hopefully someone is working on some other way to make this stuff because <laughs> it is pretty handy and it keeps the moisture in the foam instead of everywhere else if you're transporting it, which I do. Um, what else? Oh, uh, two other things you could do um, is you can use hydrangeas dried or fresh. Um, and if you're going to use them dry, I would probably recommend to only use it with other dried material, but you can just stick those in um, enough of them and you can tape them down a little bit, but they've got so much structure in them that you can just pop stems into them and it'll hold up really well. Um, and then you can eventually hide them too, if you want to. Okay, that's not what we're gonna do today. Uh, oh, and the other thing is if you're using a lot of branches, you can use the branches as the structure. Um, it can be great, but it can also take up too much space and you don't have enough room for anything else, uh, but that does work. Um, one of the things that um, I put on a list that we supplied a list of supplies that you can use, uh, pick up when you're working this way, um, and a real um, kind of luxury item is a Lazy Susan. Uh, if you're working in the round, it's great, <laughs> um, but you don't have to have it because you can you can do this too. Um, so, um, yeah, so I'm gonna use, make a compote this first time. Um, hopefully I'll get to two of them, two pieces, but we're gonna start with the compote. Um, so you got your chicken wire structure in there, fill it with water, make sure your, your vases are very clean um, because any kind of living stem doesn't want to, you know, it doesn't want, it wants to live. <laughs> it's too late for it, but it wants to. 
to live in. Um, so if you want to just put a few drops of bleach in the water, like really just a few drops, that'll keep the bacteria from forming too quickly. Um, so that's one thing you can do. So I'm going to start with some greens. And these are beautiful. I think we'll start with the cedar. How gorgeous these are. Um, I'm a big fan of foliage and texture. Um, I could fill this with just foliage and be done and love it. Um, but flowers are good too. But we're going to start with the foliage. So um, one thing you definitely want to do for any vase uh, when you're is well, you don't want to see just the rim of the vase. You want to camouflage it, um, soften it, so the so it's not a vase and and flowers or stems. Um, make a softer transition. So this will be about like this. So that's a little little long. So you know, take your stems and kind of hold it where you want it. See how long it should be and cut it there. And for woody stems, they have a harder time soaking up the water. So just kind of give it a little shave to open up more capillaries. Um, there are other ways to do it. A lot of people say crush it. We don't need any more violence in this world. Um, and it also, it must crush the capillaries too. Um, you can also split it split the stem right up the middle, about a half inch or so, and that'll just let it drink more water. So we'll do some of these. And if anyone has any questions while I'm doing this, please ask. We do have some questions, uh, Wendy, so I'll, I can read them okay. aloud. Um, we had a question that I feel like is, is a good one for right now from Leslie, who asked, what are your ideas for arrangement? Do you start with the large items? Um, so I don't know if, the, if you want to address that at all and kind of how you, kind of how you approach doing yeah. the arranging. Yeah, well, I always start um, at the base. So with greens, um, yeah, I always do. <laughs> um, I was gonna say one, the one thing, if you're using something like an amaryllis flower that has a really thick stem, that's gotta go in pretty soon, pretty early before there's so many stems that there's nowhere to put it. So the bigger, if you've got really big stems, those need to go in relatively early. Um, to use some with some little acorns on it. Um, we also had a question, Wendy, from Timothy, who was asking about how you force the flowering of a plant. Um, maybe you could address that too. Yeah. So you just cut it and bring it inside and put it in water. And we, we cut these a little early. We weren't sure if it was going to um, open or not, but it, it's starting. Um, so it just, you just trick it into thinking that it's spring. So it will take a few weeks. I think, I think we cut that about a month ago. Um, so it does take time, um, but they will. I know a lot of people forced forsythia in the spring. Um, and that seems to work well. But yeah, all you do is cut it and bring it inside. 
That's lovely. I also have a question that maybe Joan um, might be able to answer, but um, we have a question from Alejandro who asked if Asian bittersweet is what grows in front of Sawyer Library. And um, for those of you tuning in from all over, Sawyer Library is the Williams College uh, main library. So we're trying to identify where we might be seeing these things um, in, our, in our neighborhood. <laughs> You know, I don't know. I'd have to check it out to be sure. There is a native bittersweet and also an Asian bittersweet. The Asian one is much more prolific and um, really is tenacious when it starts to grow in the forest and it kills trees. So it's pretty uh, bad. I hope it's not what's growing in front of Sawyer Library. If it is, I think we should remove it. So I will take a look and see and um, if you want to email me or send me your email, I'll try and answer it. Is it so I'll look. Thanks, Joan. And I have a, was another question that came in earlier that um, I thought maybe both of you might be able to address, but it's actually about the use of, um, of invasive plants. And I think the question was about um, disposing responsibly of invasive plants. If you do use them in an arrangement, um, should they be put in garbage bags to avoid the spread of seeds? You know, what's the best practice? Um, so maybe you both have some insights on that. Uh, I burn it. <laughs> if I can, I burn it. Um, or I'll let it just dry out completely and then throw it out in the garbage. Mm -hmm. Don't put it in the compost. Do not do that. Uh, that goes for any weeds too. You know, Don't ever put your weeds yeah. in the compost. I think the safest way is to burn it. We've been um, trying to get, a, get rid of black swallow wart, which is really, it's just coming into Williamstown now. It's pretty scary. Um, and uh, our approach has been to go around and get, get the seed heads um, before they release them and then to burn them. Um, mm -hmm. I agree, I think you do have to be responsible um, in terms of, of getting rid of it. Uh, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and Joan, it is a little bit hard to hear you, so you might need to speak up again, but um, okay. we, have, we have a lot of wonderful questions coming in. And thank you all for the wonderful questions as we're yeah. watching. Uh, do her arranging and um, we might get one more and then maybe you'll sure. show us the next Wendy does that make yep. sense sure uh, a question from Barbara who's asking uh if you sp ever spray the arrangements with anything to keep them fresh or to keep dry arrangements from dropping seeds that might be a question um for you Wendy yeah um for fresh arrangements there is a floral product called um, Crowning Glory. I don't know what's in it, but it, um, it, it, uh, it's, let's see, it seals the, the leaves um, to keep moisture in. So they'll stay fresher longer. Um, and as far as dried arrangements, I have not found anything yet that, um, that will keep them, like keep them from going brittle would be nice. <laughs> Um, I, no, I don't know of anything, but like maybe a little, something a little waxy might be good. So sorry on that one. Um, one thing I did want to say for, um, anything you put in an arrangement in the water, you want to strip all the, any foliage off of the stem, anything that will be in the water, underwater, needs to be gone because that's where the bacteria really love to grow. Um, so I've got the two different evergreens in there now. I'll put some white pine in. Now it's not much of a plant really. <laughs> but it really adds a lot to an arrangement, I think. It's just got that nice, those nice straight lines that just kind of poof out. And I use a lot, a lot of greens because my aim is to hide the, all the chicken wire. 
so that I have the freedom to put flowers wherever I want. Um, And again, hiding the, the rim of the vase. Wendy, there's a little uh, question, a couple questions actually about the vessel. Um, Sarah was actually asking about the large arrangement you had, if, if the, one, the one you showed on the mantle that Joan showed us, um, if that had a vessel and how that held together. So just thinking about other sort of ways of arranging. And um, yep. Leslie asked a question. She's wondering if all metal, metal containers are okay to use for an arrangement, or do you recommend putting a glass container inside the compote if it, was, if it were to last a few weeks? Yeah, um, probably a good idea to use a glass or, or even um, plastic, like a whatever fits uh, an old soda bottle, maybe. Um, or you can get little dishes also um, little plastic dishes that come in various sizes that you can pop in uh, different metal or ceramic sometimes doesn't have, um, it might not be um, glazed on the inside. So it'll, it will bleed and lose all its water and get your table all wet too. Guess how I found that out. <laughs> um, okay. Um, let's see, anything else I want to say about this? Oh, the mantle, right. Great question. That, um, a lot to it. Um, I built two little structures. Um, they're about four feet long, foot wide and deep. Um, they were heavy because I, they were up above people's heads and there's going to be a lot of things hanging on it. So they were also weighted in the back and that was full of um, a big giant uh, um, chicken wire tube filled with um, old branches and grapevines and things to have more things to grab onto in the middle. So there are two of those. Um, and I think I put a couple of glass vases over on the end where the taller pieces are just to hold those in and keep them from drying out. Um, that was it. And then we, we could um, just pop things in and some of the vines were zip tied. A florist friend, the zip ties, uh, zip tied to the structure and to the chicken wire. So yeah, that was a that was a production. We love a production. Um, and actually, we also secured it um, with either cable or um, fishing line, maybe, because there were some nails in the back that we could just tie it off just to make sure it wasn't wouldn't fall forward. Okay. So there's a bit of a structure. Um, I can still see some chicken wire, but I think that's okay because we've got a lot of stuff here. Um, I'm going to put in some of this um, primrose. Evening primrose. Evening primrose, yeah. So I've been cutting stuff out in the field for years. I had no idea what this was. A lot of things I didn't know what they were. So this has been so great. And these are, there's so much in this. Like every, these are seed pods, Those are I imagine. Seed pods. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They're beautiful. The two tone is great. I'm going to pop these in for color. And some of this dried stuff, you don't even need clippers. Just break them off, pop them in.
Wendy, we had another question that might be relevant while you're um, while you're working right now, yep. which is um, whether you see flower arranging as a 2D form of art or more of a 3D form. Um, someone noticed that it seems that you place things in a way that might encourage specific angles of viewing. So I thought that was a wonderful question. Yeah, um, definitely 3D. Um, it, yeah, I'm kind of going for a, a, a longish shape, but uh, you know, when we're working with with plant material, you you can only be so much in charge. Um, they're really, you know, you're working with. I mean, like, you know, there's this shape. And what are you gonna do with that? <laughs> um, so yeah, I don't want to stick it straight up, but. Um, you know, we're gonna see how it goes over here. Um, and these drives are really interesting because they're they're so solid. You know, they're not gonna um, bend or flow or anything. Which is when you're using fresh flowers, you take that into consideration too. Um, did I answer that question? Um, yeah. Sure. <laughs> so I've been dying to use this privet berry, it's dark blue berries. Um, when I purchased them, so this is, as far as I know, this is the first wild privet berry I've ever used. So I'm very excited. Um, but when I when I buy it from a wholesaler. Um, it's got the, the blue berries, but they're, they're not structured like this at all. They're more of a top, a top piece, like a stem and many berries. So I don't know if it's a di different time, but there's also viburnum berries too, which maybe, I'm not sure, Joan, if they're structured the same. There are different or... kinds of privet. Um, I think this one, did you collect this on Hopper? Yes. From, yeah. So. Um, uh, this is the uh, common one, and um, it does escape into the wild. It's not native, um, so it's introduced from Eurasia also. Hmm. Uh, there are different species, though, and maybe they just provide you with a different species. Yeah, probably something that's easy to cultivate. We have so many wonderful questions and um, I also want to certainly make sure that you're sharing your insights, Wendy, as we go. But as you as you are, I, just a few things that might be um, nice to address. Someone's asking if you do have an overall shape in mind, which I think you touched on a bit with that kind of um, the long shape that you're working on right now. And someone else was also asking if, if you as you build, if there is a front side in your mind or if you're really building from all sides and then deciding at the end, which is the presentation side. Um, so just a couple of things. Good about question. Yeah, good question. Um, at this point, I don't have a front yet, um, but I have two sides going. Um, and I, I will have a front and it will be the front. <laughs> uh, but I don't know what it's going to look like yet. So it's coming along beautifully. <laughs> We're also someone, um, Lexa is asking um, if you, when you make multiple arrangements, do you build them simultaneously or one at a time? So like, do you maybe fill them all with greenery and, and then like just to keep balance as you're thinking it with, with a group of, of arrangements? Um, if they need to be the same, like for a wedding or an event, uh, I will do that or a really busy day like Valentine's Day. <laughs> I might do that. Um, so it, that is a, a, an efficient way to work. Um, so that doesn't mean I wanna do that, but, but I do when I need to. Um, just uh, cause they're kind of, you know, each one is different to me. 
um, even when they're the same. <laughs> um, so these like to stick together. Um, so it, it is a little um, less personal when you green them all up at the same time. Um, but definitely takes more time, so. Yeah, when I can, I do them individually. Because they're like kids, you know? <laughs> um, some are your favorite and some aren't so great. <laughs> Um, okay, so let's see, right now, uh, it looks like this is going to be the front. Um, uh, it just feels right, and actually these are kind of going that way, <laughs> so that's the front. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, and how long, Wendy, uh, will the will these arrangements last? Um, or and especially with evergreens, how how long might those stay green in an arrangement? Oh, these will stay for quite a while, a month, easy. Um, yeah, just keep adding fresh water. Um, they'll definitely last. Um, Let's see, what else did I want to put in here? A little bit of... It's nice lacy Queen Anne's lace. Which is interesting. I'll just comment the Queen Anne's lace is um, also not native. It's introduced. And the way it was introduced into this country is that settlers brought carrots in. And uh, some of the cultivated carrots escaped from cultivation and they rewilded and re-became wild carrots. The other interesting thing about um, wild carrots is that, um, and Queen Anne's lace, is that the uh, spokes that are holding the different um, seed heads out will open and close in response to moisture. So if they're wet, they curl up, and if they're dry, they open up. And these are pretty dry, they're, they're pretty open. Yeah. It's looking great. <laughs> yes, it's beautiful. Thanks for those um, tidbits, Joan. Actually, I have a question for you, Joan. Um, we have a really wonderful question from, I think it's Ilias, who's age six, who wants to know what the rarest flower to forage in the Berkshires is. Oh, that's yeah. <laughs> We do have some plants that are um, extremely rare, and you shouldn't forage them at all, of course. Um, there's the hairy honeysuckle, which occurs in maybe three locations in Western Massachusetts. That's very, very rare. Um, and there's the lingonberry that occurs on top of Mount Greylock. And it's the only known location. So there are some extremely wow. rare plants in our wow. habitat, but um, those plants, of course, should be protected. We shouldn't touch them at all. Um, and they're pretty That's amazing. Great advice, Jan. We also had a, a related, I think a related question. Someone was asking about apps, like phone apps that you can use to um, identify plants if, if you use those hmm. ever, and if you have any recommendations. Okay, I don't use them, but I've had friends that have used them where you can take a picture of a leaf and like, you know, it'll scan and try and give you the answer. I, there is an absolutely excellent website um, called Go Botany that's put out by the New England um, uh, Wildflower Society, and they cover every single plant in New England. And it seems daunting because you think, oh, you know, if they're making me choose among thousands of plants, how am I going to do it? But um, they have um, 
an easy key and picture key so you can narrow it down. Is your plant woody or not woody? Does it have flowers or no flowers? And oftentimes you can tell by looking at the pictures. Hmm. Um, so uh, Go Botany website is excellent um, if you want to really get into it. I have not used the apps myself, but they're worth trying. Yeah, I've, I've used picture this. Um, and I found it's pretty good, but um, if others have had experience with those kinds of apps, um, th this this website looks amazing, Joan. I put a link to it in the. I saw that. That's yeah. wonderful. Yeah. So we should definitely check that out. But if others have advice, please share in the chat. We'd love to hear what people are using. Thank you. Okay. Let's see. I want to see if we can use this gorgeous willow. So that willow, it doesn't show as yellow on the screen, but it's a beautiful golden beautiful. yellow. Beautiful, yeah. Um, and you can, when you drive around, this is a tree you can identify going 60 miles an hour because of its yellow stems. It just forms a mass of yellow stems. Um, oh, look at that. That's beautiful. I don't know if it's going to work. But... Oh. Gorgeous. So something like this. You have to, it has to work just right <laughs> or it's not going to work. Um, and since this is soft, you can bend it a little. Um, But these are so skinny on this end, I'm not sure it's going to work. Willows are one of the few plants that are unisexual. And I do believe this is a male plant that you could customize. They don't have perfect flowers. I don't know, that might work, Wendy. It looks good. Mm -hmm. no? How do you anchor it? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> uh, well, you can use a little trick with, you know, tiny little zip tie, but I didn't pull any out, so. So maybe we'll just shorten it and um, use it that way. Save that for later. Okay, that works. Yeah. Wendy, we have a few questions about whether um, you've studied Japanese flower arranging or ikebana. I haven't, but um, I've looked at it a lot. Um, and it, it's kind of, Well, you know, you don't need as much stuff as, as you do for this, um, but I love it. And it really is kind of the essential design um, to, to make something with just a few pieces, which I actually have, I was gonna show you before, earlier. This is, I showed you the, the flower pin, the pin frog. This is already in here, this is a, a a pin cup, perfect for an ikebana piece. So you just put the water in there and you can just stick your stems right in that and, it, and it's perfect. Um, so it will probably do that at some point with this stuff. Um, but I, so I love the, the colors with this beach and the blueberries and the gold of the, um, the dried primrose. And the beech trees are easy to pick out in the forest because the ones that hold their leaves are the juvenile beeches. 
the young beeches that are just coming up through the forest floor. And they hold their leaves because, you know, they want to hold on to them as long as possible because they only have light when the upper tree trees have lost their leaves. So they hang on to their leaves longer. And then they end up holding them for the whole winter, a lot of them. Very easy to find. Mm, that's wonderful, Joan. That's a great tip. <laughs> and I've um, noticed... Joan, I, I, little... I was just going to say, I've noticed that... Um, there's a few different colors of the beach out there. Um, just slight, slight tones. Um, I think, you probably can't tell, but I think this is a lighter one and this is a little bit darker. And then I've definitely seen darker still, almost, almost a little bit reddish brown in there. Very cool. And the other thing with beach is that they have these really spectacular winter buds uh, anticipating spring. They look like orange cigars. I always call it the orange cigar, um, but <laughs> John, we had a question about black cohosh. Um, Emily was asking that, uh, was saying that they had a hard time finding it in the wild and was wondering whether that's one we should avoid harvesting or if there maybe was a plentiful patch uh, here in this region. Um, I thought that was a good, good question. I think it's relatively common as a spring herb. Um, I would hesitate to pick too much of it. It is one of our native wildflowers. And um, um, so, you know, anything that impinges on those populations maybe would be better to avoid if you can find something else. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. And Wendy, how often should um, those who are making bouquets at home plan to change the water? I, I, and can you even change the water? <laughs> how do you manage? Um, you can. Um, it, it can be tricky, <laughs> for sure. Um, at the very least, add more water, add fresh water. Um, if it's manageable, you can kind of grab it and tip it. Um, or uh, put it in the shower or in the tub um, or into the sink and just let it overflow. Um, so I'm almost done with this, I think. Um, but I thought um, since I had them, oh. Well, I do have some Alstroemeria. So oh, lovely. Um, but I also have some perfectly colored ah, yellow roses. Gorgeous. So, you know, roses you can get at the grocery store too. Um, Think, I think we could use a little of both here. So I, I take all the, the foliage off of them because that will, will wither and die faster than the flowers will. These will last, Alstrom Lemaria will last two weeks in a vase, easy. Um, especially uh, like Joan, like you had just in a vase, just the Alstrom Lemaria in the vase. If you just clip that, every few days and give it fresh water. Absolutely, two or three weeks. But you've also picked out perfect flower colors um, for this particular arrangement. Yeah. And Wendy, will, will you post a picture of the final arrangement on your Instagram? Sure. <laughs> We'd love to see it. I'll put a link to your Instagram um, 
just a shout out that Wendy, in addition to being a wonderful arranger of flowers, is also a beautiful photographer of flowers. And <sighs> she did take all of the photos of the botanicals that we included in our resource guide, which we linked to, um, and which you'll also have a link to through our follow-up email tomorrow. Um, so uh, I'll put a link to her Instagram, which is definitely worth following. Great. Thank you. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, and also, if, um, if anyone wants to uh, go to my website, um, if you go to the floral subscription, flower subscription page, um, on that page, there's a sign up for newsletters or information. <laughs> I don't really do newsletters, but um, if you want to learn anything else, if I do any more workshops or if I'm offering any um, whatever I'm doing, I can let you know. Um, it's nice to have people who want to know. <laughs> Um, so, uh, so I guess we're pretty much out of time, um, but is that the front? This is the front. <laughs> right. Let's put, pop one more in there. Looks gorgeous. So, and these roses are just really great roses. They open beautifully and Okay, so there we go. Let's see if that one will stay where it needs to stay. And are they particular kinds of roses? I mean, how do you know to get the right kind? Um, this, all roses have a name, have, you know, some fancy or silly name. This one is called Combo. Okay. Uh, so there we go. So we got a little, you know, movement, whether they're moving or standing still. Beautiful. Any other Thank questions? You. So beautiful, Wendy. Um, I'm going to just come on. We did have a couple of more. We had so many great questions. Thank you to everybody who has stuck around and um, for your incredible engagement with us. If you, um, maybe we'll just try to answer a couple more quickly. If you have to pop off, no worries. This is being recorded and you can always access the video on our website. We'll be sharing that very soon. Um, but let's see, we did have a question. Um, about picking invasives, um, whether it's good enough to just pick them or if you if it's actually better to perhaps cut down to the ground. Um, was curious about that. It's better to remove them entirely. And yeah, dig up the whole thing. The whole thing. <laughs> Pull the roots out, they'll re-sprout. I mean, yeah, it's not, um, but it's hard work. It's really, really hard to get rid of invasives. Um, and you yeah. just have to keep at it. But you have to remove the whole thing. The only trick there is you want to be sure they're invasive, right? Because <laughs> you would remove something that's good for our environment. So that's where that kind of being sure of identification is important. Um, on a related note, we also had a question from uh, a student, I think, um, who was asking, or someone part of the Williams community, about um, whether there might be any plans to introduce more native plants to campus. So that's a Williams specific question, um, but I think great one. I don't know, Joan, if you know anything about do that. More of it. I, I would like to even see more native plants, but in the redo of the science buildings, we actually met with the landscape architects and asked that native plants be put in. Um, so they are paying attention, but then sometimes when push comes to shove, the native plants somehow didn't get here, but some of them did. And so um, we are trying to keep an eye on that and um, help from students would be great. Um, if they can push for it even more, that would be wonderful. Uh, but we, we're trying to pay attention. I know to um, Pallavi Sen, who's in the art department, has been working on some really wonderful um, plant-based projects on the campus of Williams College, including a pollinator meadow behind the Spencer Art Building and also a vegetable garden as well. So I think um, her efforts 
are have been really incredible uh, for for the campus too. Um, so hopefully there'll be more to share about that in, in time to come. Um, a couple of specific sort of identification and and um, and also uh, sort of technique questions from Leslie. Um, one is a question about what those brilliant roadside red stem branches uh, that Leslie's seen on the roadside in Maine might be, um, she's used them with evergreen branches. Might they be of the burnum? Joan, do you have any insights? I think they're probably red osier dogwood. What, what do you think, Wendy? Yeah. Right, definitely. right red. Typically, yeah, look to see if they have opposite branching, opposite leaves, although viburnum would also have opposite mm -hmm. leaves. But the bright red is almost surely a red osier dogwood. They tend to grow in sort of wet areas. Mm -hmm. They're used pretty widely in landscaping on the Williams College campus. We have quite a few of those, and that is a native species. It's a wonderful plant. Yeah, beautiful. I know exactly what that, what you're talking about. It's a gorgeous, gorgeous mm -hmm. plant. Um, also, um, a, maybe a tip perhaps, but with lilies, is it true that if you remove the stamens of lilies, the flowers will last longer? Um, I don't think so. The reason we remove them is because they stain. Mm. They're, they're so deep, dark, rusty, orangey red, um, especially, and they do, you know, the pollen will come off on everything. It's hard to get out, yeah. especially if it's a wedding dress. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, that's a good, that is a good tip though. They are big stainers. Um, I've gotten them on my nose, walked around with like <laughs> a after, after smelling a lily. Um, another quick question about the Go Botany uh, site. Is it, is it a good um, site, Joan, for aquatic plants um, yes, as well? Yes, I think they cover everything. They cover certainly all native plants and all introduced plants that are wild. Uh, what I think they may not cover are garden plants, you know, purely mm -hmm. cultivated plants, but otherwise they are extraordinarily comprehensive. They had a $1 million grant from the National Science Foundation to put it together. It's done by just the top botanists in New England. It's just, uh, it's an excellent, excellent uh, website. Thank you so much for sharing that. I, I'll actually put a link to that site in the, in the resource packet that we're sharing out um, too, right. so people can have that. Um, maybe one final question and then another final look at the beautiful arrangement um, as people sign off. But a uh, question also about Williams, um, wondering about how much Williams is interested in labeling the horticulture on the campus. Um, sort of some other campuses I know do that, like Smith and Swarthmore. Um, labeling is wonderful. So is this someone advocating for maybe seeing more of that at Williams, yes. Jonah? We've started that uh, in some places. There are a few things that are labeled. I think we need to do a lot more labeling. It would be great. Uh, the Smith campus is a model to be um, uh, to be followed. They have such a strong botanical presence, and I, I think William should come up to their standards. That would be wonderful. Yeah, I love Smith. I, I wish we had on Williams campus like a beautiful um, like winter garden, <laughs> those beautiful um, indoor spaces where you can see plants all year round. And Swarthmore yeah. was an arboretum. So both of those colleges, Williams has not had that um, history, but I think we certainly could do it and I think we should. Yeah, more plants. <laughs> well, I really, I want to just say a huge, huge thank you to both of you, Joan and Wendy. This has been such a delight. And um, I really hope all of you who joined us tonight will feel inspired to spend time in your own landscapes. Um, it is so amazing to see where people are coming from. We had some folks from Amsterdam, California, um, all over the wow. <laughs> and, um so I'm sure your landscapes all look a little different this time of year, but I hope this inspires you to, to look closely, to explore, to anticipate the change of seasons. Um, and maybe we can get one final beautiful look uh, at our beautiful arrangement, Wendy. I'm gonna <laughs> highlight you. Look at that gorgeous, gorgeous arrangement. It's so inspiring. And I have to say, Joan, your beautiful comment that we can make friends with flowers. Um, is just so heart heartfelt in Absolutely. this. Time. So I encourage you all to go make friends with flowers wherever you are. <laughs> Thank you, Joan. Thank you, Wendy. Um, it, we Thank do you.
a survey um, that goes out after these events. We, we love to hear from folks. If people want to share their contact information with us too, we're happy to be in touch. We're happy to hear your comments, your questions. Um, and we're just so excited to have so many wonderful people join us this evening and um, to have both of you together, Joan and Wendy. So a big thank you to you both, a huge thank you to Anne. And um, we, we hope we'll see uh, you all soon at another program in coming weeks. Take thank care, you. everybody. Thank you, everyone. It was lovely. Your display is beautiful, Wendy, just gorgeous. <laughs> thank you. I'll make more. <laughs> oh, exciting. I've got lots of stuff. Good. Good. We'll see everyone soon. Take care, thank everyone. You.